300 years ago in Germany lived a very large and well-known family by the name of Bach. Although they lived in different towns and cities, once a year all the Bachs, cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandparents came together to have a musical festival among themselves. Most of the Bach men earned a living as church musicians, town musicians, and organists. Since they all loved music, the chief recreation of the day was singing to the accompaniment of many instruments. In March of 1685, in the town of Eisenach, a new member of the Bach family was christened. He was named Johann Sebastian Bach. Sebastian's father, who was the town musician in his village, gave the young boy lessons on the clavier and violin. A clavier was a keyboard instrument common in those times. Sebastian was quick to learn, and soon he had learned almost all that his father was able to teach him. When Sebastian was nine, he went to live at the home of his older brother, Christophe, who was organist in a large church in the city of Ordruf. Since both father and mother Bach had died, Christophe and his wife agreed to give Sebastian a home, education, and music lessons. Sebastian learned his music so quickly that his brother was amazed. Before long, Sebastian had mastered all the pieces his brother had given him to play, and he wanted to learn something more difficult. Sebastian knew that there was a book of clavier pieces locked in the bookcase. However, his brother did not want Sebastian to have the book. For what reason, no one knows. While everyone was sleeping, Sebastian would squeeze his small hand between the lattice-work doors of the bookcase and take the wonderful book. Then, by the light of the moon, he would copy it. Sebastian learned a great deal about music because he would study it as he wrote it down. Then, after hours of copying, he would put the book away. Later, while Sebastian was learning to play the pieces he had copied, his brother learned what the boy had done. He was so angry that he took all the pages away from Sebastian and refused to let him have the precious music he had spent six months copying. Sebastian attended school where he studied music, Latin, Greek, religion, and arithmetic. He excelled in all his subjects, but especially in music. The school had a very fine choir, and Sebastian was a member. In addition to singing for church services, the choir also performed at festivals, weddings, and funerals. For these extra performances, the choir received money that was used to support the school and to pay the choir boys a small salary. When Sebastian was 15, he and a friend set off to walk to the town of Lundberg, which was 200 miles away. He had learned that the church of St. Michael's in Lundberg needed choir boys, and his brother's house had become so crowded with his own growing family that Sebastian decided it was time for him to leave and earn his own living. Both Sebastian and his friend were immediately accepted by the choir school, and since they were both fine musicians, they were put into a select group called the Maiden Scholars. There were only about 15 boys in this group, and it is said they were the finest choir in Germany. At St. Michael's, Sebastian was able to study the finest music of the time because the school had one of the largest music collections in all Germany. He seldom needed teachers to show him how to compose or play. He would study the compositions closely and then compose in the same manner, perhaps even better. By now, in addition to playing the clavier, organ, and violin, he had learned to play several other stringed instruments. Also, he composed his first chorales or hymns. This is one. One day when he was 18, Sebastian walked all the way to the city of Hamburg to hear a great organist. On his way home, he sat down to rest outside an inn. He was hungry, but he had no money to buy a meal. Suddenly, two fish heads were thrown out the window. He picked them up and found that each of them contained a valuable coin. Apparently, someone inside had seen the hungry boy and wanted to help him. This unexpected wealth not only allowed him to have a good meal, but it enabled him to make another trip to Hamburg to hear the great organist. 
Soon Sebastian found a job playing violin in the orchestra at the residence of a nobleman in Weimar. Since Weimar was closest to Anstadt, where some of Sebastian's relatives lived, he could take occasional walks to visit them and to play the organs in some of the churches. On one of his trips to Arnstadt, when he played the organ, the people of the church were so pleased with his music that they asked him to move to their city and become their organist and choir director. Sebastian accepted the position. Now, for the first time, he had an organ for his own use and enough time to practice and perfect his playing. For Easter the next year, Sebastian, who was then about 19 years old, composed a wonderful cantata, a group of solo songs and choruses telling the story of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Trumpets and violins were sometimes used in addition to the organ in certain church services, and the Easter cantata is one of Bach's works that uses these extra instruments. This same year, Sebastian's brother Jakob left Germany to take a job as oboist in the service of Charles XII of Sweden. Sebastian was pleased with his brother's success, but at the same time was sad to see him depart. For the farewell gathering, Sebastian composed a piece called Capriccio on the Departure of a Beloved Brother. The next year in the fall, Sebastian walked a distance of 50 miles from Anstadt to Lübeck to hear the great organist and composer Buxtehude, who was playing at a church there. It was a wonderful experience for Sebastian to hear the great Buxtehude playing the magnificent organ. The 20-year-old Sebastian learned a great deal from the famous old musician. Time passed more rapidly than Sebastian thought possible, and before long, the four weeks of his leave had expired but he stayed on until he had been there 16 weeks. Finally, Sebastian returned to Arnstadt. The leaders of his church were enraged at his having stayed away so long, so it was necessary for Bach to look for another position. He soon moved to the town of Mulhausen, where he became organist in one of the churches. In addition to his salary, he also received three measures of corn, two cords of wood, and six bushels of brushwood annually. While this was not an extremely large salary, it was enough for him and his wife, whom he had married shortly before. Every year in Mulhausen, there was a great festival to celebrate the installation of the new town council. Sometimes Bach wrote special music for these occasions. When Bach was 23, he and his wife moved to Weimar so he could take a job at the palace of the Duke. He was to be the chief organist, and his most important duty was to compose religious music to be played and sung in the court chapel. Once while visiting Dresden, a city some distance away, Bach was asked to play the harpsichord for some noblemen. They were so impressed with his skill in playing and with his compositions that they arranged a contest between Bach and a famous French musician who was also visiting the city. But the French musician suddenly left town and never appeared for the contest. It was agreed that Bach was the greatest musician of his time. It is said that once Bach played the organ for Prince Frederick of Cassel, who later became King of Sweden. The prince was so amazed at the brilliance and beauty of Bach's music that he took a ring of precious stones from his finger and gave it to Bach. During the nine years he lived in Weimar, Bach composed a tremendous amount of organ music. One of the most outstanding types of music he wrote is called the fugue. A fugue is a melody played several ways at one time, but being so skillfully combined that they sound harmonious, like this. Then Bach accepted a position conducting the orchestra at the palace of Prince Leopold in the city of Goten. While working there, a visiting nobleman from the city of Brandenburg asked Bach to compose some music for him. These pieces are now known as the Brandenburg Concertos. Bach gave music lessons to his growing family of children. 
And for Friedman, his oldest son, he wrote a book of exercises and pieces called The Little Clavier Book. These pieces are still used today when people take piano lessons. Perhaps you have played some of them. In the time of Bach, keyboard instruments were tuned differently from the way they are today. You could play in only one key, and if you played in another key, the instrument sounded out of tune. Bach discovered that by making small adjustments in the way strings of the instruments were tuned, he could play in any key and the music sounded good. So to demonstrate his new discovery, he wrote a collection of pieces called The Well-Tempered Clavier. When Bach was 36 years old, he married again. His first wife had passed away the year before. Anna Magdalene, his new wife, loved music also. He wrote a book of pieces for her. He gave music lessons to other pupils as well as to his own children. Pupils came from all over Europe to study with the great Bach. He would write exercises and short pieces for them to play, like the ones called the two-part inventions. Soon Bach moved his family to Leipzig so he could become cantor in the St. Thomas School. As cantor, he was in charge of the music, and in addition, he taught Latin, grammar, and religion. Bach remained there for the rest of his life. During his years in Leipzig, Bach composed much music for the church. Each new work was more magnificent than the one before. One of the most noble examples of his church music is the St. Matthew Passion. The last years of Bach's life were spent in Leipzig. People came from all parts of Europe to visit the great master. He continued to compose many great works. He also traveled to many cities in Germany, giving organ concerts. Johann Sebastian Bach was one of the greatest organists and composers who ever lived. Robert Schumann. In the music of Robert Schumann, just as in his life, we find great joy. and deep sadness. But above all, Schumann's music expresses his poetic love of nature and the wonder of the universe. Poetry and music were closely linked in Schumann's compositions, and both played an important part in his life. This large, comfortable house in the little German town of Zwickau was the birthplace of Robert Schumann. He was born on June 8, 1810, the youngest of the five children of Johanna and August Schumann. When Robert was a small child, his mother taught him to sing little songs while she played the piano. Although Robert's mother encouraged her children to enjoy music, 
she felt that music should be a spare time hobby, not a career. Robert began taking piano lessons when he was seven years old. He was soon able to make up little tunes for his own amusement or to play for his family and friends. Even at this early age, Robert began to express his feelings in music. Robert's father, who owned a bookshop, often brought home musical compositions for Robert and his school friends to play. The boys had formed a neighborhood orchestra when Robert was about 12. They spent many enjoyable hours playing different kinds of music. Robert spent much time in his father's bookshop. August Schumann was also a writer, and sometimes Robert helped gather information for him. Robert loved to read, and the bookshop supplied him with plenty of reading material. He especially liked to read poetry. One of Robert's favorite pastimes was enjoying the peaceful woods near the town. Here he could daydream as much as he liked. Often he wrote poems about the beauty to be found in nature. As a teenager, Robert formed a literary club where he and his friends met to talk about great books and writers. Robert and some of the other members also read aloud some of their own work for criticism by the group. Robert couldn't decide which he liked best, poetry or music. When Robert was 16, he and his mother were deeply grieved when his father died. Without his father's guidance and support, Robert had to give up his hope for a career in either music or literature. His mother wanted him to become a lawyer. She thought this would be a more practical way of earning a living. Two years later, Robert was graduated from the Zwickau Academy. He agreed to follow his mother's advice and go to the University of Leipzig to study law. But first, he decided to make the most of his last holiday before entering college. Robert and his friend Gisbert Rosen, their pockets stuffed with favorite books, set out on a trip through the country. They both loved poetry and nature and looked at the new places they visited with the deep appreciation of poets. They visited the home of the gifted writer Jean Paul, whose writings both boys had read and loved. Jean Paul's widow gave them each flowers from the poet's garden as a remembrance. The feeling Jean Paul had expressed in his works had a great influence on Robert throughout his life. The poetic description of a masked ball in one of Jean Paul's novels was probably the inspiration for one of Schumann's first important musical compositions. Robert completed this composition during his university days, and it is considered the masterpiece of his early creative years. Robert took his piano with him to the University of Leipzig, he promised his mother to put his law studies first and music second, but he found this promise hard to keep. He often turned to his piano and his music for consolation. His law studies did not interest him, and city life gave him no opportunity to roam the countryside as he had done at home. Robert often joined other students to play chamber music at informal social gatherings. Sometimes he and his friends played music Robert had written. His friends urged him to send his compositions to a noted conductor to get his opinion of Robert's talent. The conductor's reply was encouraging. He indicated that Robert's work showed great talent. However, he advised Robert to get more technical training so that he could express himself fully in his compositions. Robert wasted no time in making arrangements to take music lessons. Friedrich Wieck was the teacher Robert chose. Wieck had trained his talented nine-year-old daughter, Clara, to be a concert pianist. 
Robert had seen how successful Vick's method had been with Clara and hoped Vick could help him also. Vick was a strict teacher and Robert worked very hard to perfect his piano technique. But even this work did not cure Robert's unhappiness at Leipzig. Robert felt that he would be happier at the University of Heidelberg, where his friend Rosen had gone. Robert's mother finally agreed to let him change schools. On the way to Heidelberg, Robert saw the Rhine River for the first time. A boatman and his daughter took Robert for a ride just at sunset. The coloring of the sky and the peaceful majesty of the calm river were sights Robert never forgot. Later, one of his finest symphonies was inspired by the beauty of the Rhine River. The turning point in Schumann's career came in 1830, when he attended a concert given by the famous violinist Paganini. Robert was so impressed that he determined to become as great a master of the piano as Paganini was of the violin. He soon realized that this would require his full-time attention, leaving him no time to study law. After much thought, Robert wrote to his mother, telling her he wanted to make music his career. Friedrich Wieck also wrote to her, guaranteeing that he would make Robert a great pianist. Mrs. Schumann was not at all pleased, but agreed to let Robert study nothing but music for a trial period of six months. Robert returned to Leipzig, where Friedrich Wieck and Clara, now almost 12 years old, greeted him warmly. For a time, Robert stayed with the Wieks, studying, practicing, and composing. Robert and Clara became great friends. Often they took long walks together, and Robert used to tell ghost stories to amuse his young friend. Both Robert and Clara enjoyed their walks. They needed to relax from Mr. Wieks' strict program of study and piano practice. In 1831, Schumann's first work was published, a brilliant piece for the piano. Robert called it the Abegg Variations and dedicated it to an imaginary countess, Pauline von Abegg. He thought this would impress the people back home in Zwickau and make them think he was friendly with the nobility. Robert tried to improve his piano playing by tying up one of his fingers during long practice hours. He thought his other fingers would have to move faster and become more skillful. This resulted in a serious injury to his right hand. Robert visited doctor after doctor, hoping that the damage could be repaired, but there was nothing the doctors could do. The injury was permanent. While this meant the end of Robert's dreams of becoming a great pianist, it worked out for the best in another way. Now he concentrated his efforts on composing. In discussions with other musicians and artists, Schumann got the idea of publishing a magazine to call public attention to the works of young composers and also to keep the public from forgetting the greatness of musicians of the past. In 1834, the first issue of the magazine was published, and Schumann wrote articles and reviews for it regularly for the next ten years. Meanwhile, Clara Wieck, at 13, had become a fine concert pianist. At a concert in Robert's hometown of Zwickau, she played one of his compositions. Robert's mother noticed her son's admiration for Clara and predicted that Robert would someday marry Clara but her prediction was not easily fulfilled. When Clara was 17, she and Robert asked her father to consent to their marriage. Mr. Wieck was furious and refused to give his consent. He had trained Clara to be a great pianist. He felt that her concert work was more important than becoming a wife and mother. 
Robert and Clara had to part many times in the years that followed. Mr. Veek kept Clara busy traveling on concert tours, but she and Robert kept in touch by writing letters. Robert also sent Clara his new compositions, which she played in her concerts. Robert now worked harder than ever at composing. Often his landlady had to scold him as he improvised far into the night. But much great music, full of deep feeling, came from his lonely suffering. One particularly fine work was the piano sonata in F-sharp minor, which he dedicated to Clara. Schumann also turned to his early love of poetry for further inspiration. He wrote many beautiful songs, setting to music the poetry of romantic poets such as Heine, Goethe, Byron, and Hans Christian Andersen. Finally, in 1840, Clara and Robert were married in a village church near Leipzig. They had obtained from the courts legal permission to marry without Mr. Veek's consent. Some years later, Clara's father got over his anger, and there was peace in the family once more. The Schumanns had only one piano, so whenever Robert wanted to compose, Clara gave up her practicing. She still continued her concert tours to help earn money for the family's living expenses. When Clara went on tours, Robert usually stayed home and took care of their daughter, and later, of their other children as well. Sometimes, Robert went with Clara on her tours, but he was often hurt because no one paid any attention to him. His own work was still unknown to most of the general public. To many concert goers, he was merely the husband of a famous pianist. Schumann began to compose large quantities of music with great speed. His motto was to go ceaselessly forward, but he did this at the expense of his health. Music just for the piano or poetic songs no longer gave him enough room to express his talent. He now composed overtures, symphonies, choral music, and chamber music. When Schumann was 40 years old, he was appointed conductor of the Dusseldorf Orchestra, a position he had long wanted. But he had little experience in conducting, and often became so absorbed in the music, he forgot all about the musicians he was supposed to direct. There was much criticism of his conducting. This added to the strain of overwork from composing and writing for the music magazine. Almost the only relaxation Robert had came when Clara and their children could persuade him to join them on an outing, especially one on the banks of his beloved Rhine River. Schumann still loved nature in all its forms and drew his greatest inspiration from it. One of the last happy events in Schumann's life was the enthusiastic approval the public gave his music at a concert in Hanover in 1854. The concert had been arranged by Schumann's good friends, Johannes Brahms, the gifted composer, and Josef Joachim, the talented violinist and conductor. Schumann, tired from overwork, tried to find peace in walks along the Rhine near his Dusseldorf home. But even the river he loved so well could not overcome the feeling of deep gloom that he began to have more and more often. He even tried to end his life by throwing himself into the river, but was rescued by some boatmen. The last two years of Schumann's life were spent in a small hospital. For a time, he was able to go for walks on the hospital grounds, and Clara and his friends visited him often. But his illness grew worse, and in 1856, at the age of 46, Robert Schumann died.
In the years after Schumann's death, his music grew in popularity, and it is appreciated more now than it was during his lifetime. For as long as people love poetry and nature, they will continue to love the music of Robert Schumann. happiness their harmony foretells. The molten golden notes of the bells, bells, bells. The rhyming and the chiming of the bells. This was the way Edgar Allan Poe, the great American poet, once portrayed the musical chime so dear to his heart. His poetry could have as easily described the mammoth, magnificent church bells of old Russia. Those precisely tuned instruments that once could be heard to ring from almost every Russian spire and steeple. This Russian citizen, like so many of his countrymen, was fascinated by these bells from childhood. His name was Sergei Vasilyevich Rachmaninoff. He was one of the world's most beloved pianists, conductors, and composers. And the glorious sound of the bells haunted his music throughout his long and creative career. That career began in 1882, just three years after America's Thomas Edison produced the world's first practical artificial electric light. It was at this time that nine-year-old Sergei Rachmaninoff was given his first piano lessons by his musically gifted mother. Not long afterward, Sergei's talented sister introduced him to the songs of the great Russian composer, Peter Tchaikovsky. At the time, neither of them could have guessed how important Tchaikovsky and his music would one day be to Sergei's own musical development. No one could have guessed either how Sergei would be influenced by the frequent visits he made with his grandmother to services at the Russian Orthodox Cathedral in St. Petersburg. The magnificent hymns and spine-chilling bells he heard there were to have a powerful effect on the music he would one day compose. By his tenth birthday, Sergei's musical interests grew so strong that his mother decided to enroll him in the famous St. Petersburg Conservatory of Music. In time, however, Sergei lost interest in his classes. He had so much skill and imagination that the training at the school seemed childish and dull to him. Two years later, his mother removed him from the school, hoping to find a more suitable way in which to develop her son's talent. That way was eventually found in 1885, when 12-year-old Sergei moved into the home of Nikolai Zverev, a widely known Moscow piano teacher. Zverev was famed for his method of inviting into his home promising young musicians whom he would train without charge. Here, under the master's strict supervision, Sergei studied music, literature, and languages, and also laid the foundation for his skills as a pianist. But Zverev was to help Sergei's musical career in another way, too. Zverev was a good friend of Peter Tchaikovsky, the great Russian composer whose songs had interested Sergei several years previously. One day, Zverev came across a piano composition which Sergei had written and promptly showed it to Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky was so impressed with Sergei's music that he soon took the boy under his wing at the great Moscow Conservatory. Here, Sergei's musical skills developed rapidly, and his musical growth was more than matched by his physical growth. 
for only four years later, Sergei had become a six foot four giant. Now 18 years old, Sergei Rachmaninoff applied for the conservatory's highest award, the precious gold medal. He learned that in order to compete, he would have to compose an opera. When the judges reviewed the score of Sergei's opera, which he called Aleko, they were astounded to learn that he had composed the work in just two weeks. They were even more astonished at the opera's quality. They voted unanimously to grant him the gold medal award, an honor presented over the years to only a mere handful of contestants. His schooling now over, Sergei's good fortune continued when a Moscow firm published one of his first piano compositions, the brilliant Prelude in C-sharp minor. It took the world by storm and made him an instant success everywhere it was played. Listen. Composer soon repeated his achievement by conducting the first public performance of the opera with which he had won the gold medal. It, too, was an instant triumph and seemed to assure him of continuing success. But a few years later, Rachmaninoff found that success was not always to be so easily won. When his first symphony was premiered in Moscow in 1897, the performance was so poor it received little applause. Rachmaninoff fled the concert hall in shame and self-disgust. In the months that followed, the sensitive composer brooded so deeply over his failure that he began to lose confidence in his musical talent. Finally, at the suggestion of friends, he visited Dr. Nikolai Dahl, a Moscow psychologist. Dr. Dahl was famous for his ability to treat emotional disorders by means of hypnotism. As Rachmaninoff's first session with Dahl began, the doctor asked a pointed question. This new piano concerto you speak of, have you composed any of it yet? No, I, I seem to lack the self-confidence to, to, to go ahead with it somehow. I, I don't know, doctor. I just can't seem to get it started. In that case, let us begin. You will begin to write your new concerto. You will work with great ability and skill. Your concerto will be of excellent quality. As the doctor repeated over and over again the soothing, healing words, Rachmaninoff gradually began to accept the ideas being planted in his mind. In time, Dr. Dahl's treatments proved successful, and Rachmaninoff's self-confidence was restored. The composer soon completed his new piano score, the great Piano Concerto No. 2 in C minor. It was destined to become one of the most popular concert pieces of all time. Rachmaninoff's marriage brought him still further happiness. His good fortune continued, and before long he found himself in demand all over Moscow, both as a conductor and as a concert pianist. In his mid-thirties, he was awarded the famed Glinka Prize, one of Russia's highest musical awards, for one of the best loved works in all musical history. This great masterpiece was the warm and soulful Second Symphony in E minor.
This fine painting by the Swiss artist Arnold Bucklin made a great impression on Rachmaninoff when he happened to see it on a visit to an art museum. It was this masterpiece that inspired Rachmaninoff to compose a symphonic poem, which many critics call his finest achievement, the haunting Isle of the Dead. As went by, however, the tall, gentle composer once again developed secret doubts about his music. He was troubled when the critics called him a second-rate Tchaikovsky and accused him of refusing to keep up with the times. Concern of another kind took hold of Rachmaninoff in 1914, when his country became involved in the First World War. During the next four years, he made frequent charity appearances, turning over all his proceeds to the sick and the wounded. In 1917, the composer's troubles multiplied when the Bolshevik Revolution took place. In a matter of days, the communists swept away the old Russian government, and with it, the only way of life Rachmaninoff had ever known. Now, with his beloved country in unfriendly and unsympathetic hands, Rachmaninoff decided to make a new life for himself and his family in the United States. Within days of his arrival, he was thrust into an American concert career and from then on was in constant demand everywhere. Although this new life made him famous, popular and rich, Rachmaninoff continued to long for the old Russia he had once known and would never know again. He was so homesick that he did not compose anything for ten long years. He often spent months at his lovely summer home in Switzerland. And with the passage of time, Rachmaninoff eventually regained his musical soul. It was here, while in his early fifties, that he created one of his greatest works for piano and orchestra, The Rhapsody on a Theme by Paganini. As the years went by, public demand for his talents forced Rachmaninoff to increase the exhausting pace of his overcrowded concert schedule. Now he had almost no time at all in which to compose. In 1940, however, Rachmaninoff somehow found the time and energy for a work that was destined to become his final contribution to the world of music. A darkly brilliant orchestral explosion entitled Symphonic Dances. Three years later, in the midst of what was to be a farewell tour, the tall, gentle musician became seriously ill. Death found him several months afterward, in the spring of 1943, just four days short of his 70th birthday. Even in life, Sergei Rachmaninoff had seemed something of a legend. Now, in death, he was honored almost as a fallen hero through concerts, recordings, and motion pictures devoted to his music. Music of a special, highly personal kind. Music which represented the last remaining link with that great Russian tradition which began with Tchaikovsky. Music packed with power, crowded with color, 
and sincere to its very roots. First and foremost, however, Sergei Rachmaninoff's music is Russian music. Heartfelt, darkly brooding, spiritually deep, full of rich and restless energy, like the Russian people themselves. In many places in his music, we find a certain combination of notes which resembles the ringing of bells, like this. It's not hard to imagine, is it, that passages like this one may well have been inspired by the magnificent church bells of old Russia, which so fascinated Rachmaninoff all his life. At the core of Rachmaninoff's music is a troubled heart, one burdened with self-doubt and homesickness for his beloved Russia. We hear this distress echoed in his use of minor keys, like this one. Rachmaninoff's wistful yearning for the peace of mind he was somehow never able to attain may be recognized quite easily in many places in his music. A good example is this passage from his second symphony, which almost says, I am longing, I am yearning, listen. Another of Rachmaninoff's special trademarks is his use of long, flowing melodies. One of them is this theme from his second piano concerto, which several years ago was turned into a very successful popular song. This almost boundless gift for magnificent melody, and with a soul and spirit as deep as the very people from which he came, Sergei Rachmaninoff, at the turn of the century, began giving the world some of the warmest and most heartfelt music ever composed. For almost 50 years, this tall, quiet Russian dominated the concert stage as few musicians in history were able to do. At his death, he left us with a musical heritage which has since enriched the lives of millions the world over. Sergei Vasilyevich Rachmaninoff, pianist, conductor, composer, one of Russia's most sincere spokesmen of the heart, and the musical world's beloved gentle giant.